Father, wherever you're joining us from, we're so excited that you could be here. We're ready to worship the Lord. And I want to encourage you with the scripture that I read this week. This is from the book of Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. The Bible says, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So that's my encouragement to you wherever you are. We're going to sing a song that actually affirms that our God, with God, nothing is impossible. So wherever you are, rise on your feet. And let's worship this King of kings and Lord of lords who makes all things possible. Amen. Let's go. I put this together, everybody. Come on. Hey. We worship you, Lord. We give you all the glory.
Savior never changes, yeah. and never ends, oh God. We lift your name on high, oh God. We magnify you, oh God. You are good. There is no one like you, oh God. We thank you, Jesus. You are a merciful Savior. There is nobody else like you, oh God. You remain the same. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a land could rescue the souls of men? souls of men. Lord, we love you, we lift you, we magnify you. Wonderful, everybody's wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a land could rescue the soul?
What an amazing time of music and dance that was. Thank you so much, our music team, for allowing us to worship in song and in dance and in reflection, especially through this uh, Easter season. But there's another way that you also engage in the manner of worship, and that is through giving uh, of our tithes, of our offerings, of our sacrificial gifts. And I want to invite you to be able to do that. There's something my wife and I have been doing for a while now. Every time we get paid, every time we get some money, we always take a book and we record uh, and we start with our tithes and we start and then we go to offerings, then we do savings and then we write the list of things that we need. And we've done that for a while, uh, either on a book or an app. And one day I was thinking, I, I can't wait for this day my son is able to read and comprehend. He can read now, but I'm not sure he's able to comprehend what the list means. And I want him one day to ask me, uh, uh, you know, Dad, what does, why do we always ta start with tithe? Why do we always go to offerings? Why do you always do this? And there's an answer given to us in the book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 26. And the Bible says, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of all this? Then tell them. And so that day, I want to pick him up, put him on my lap and say, son, we were not always believers. We didn't always have a purpose. We were not always pastors. We didn't always have an income. But the Lord in our stretched arm yanked us from that a purposelessness and he gave us a, a purpose we got born again and so right now every time we receive an income it's our way of remembering that god is still providing us it's our way of remembering that god is still with us it's our way of saying god we want to partner with you in ensuring that the gospel goes to other people who don't have access to that it's our way of saying lord nine out of ten is greater than ten out of ten without you and that's why we give our tithes. That's why we give our offerings. That's why we want to partner with the Lord uh, in doing ministry in this way. And so if you're there and you're giving your offerings today, I want you to give them not just so that you can receive God's blessings, but because you've already received God's blessing. I want you to do it in such a way to say, Lord, this is my sign of gratitude. This is my way of saying I want to respond to the love that you've already shown or get brought my way. And so we want to gladly receive the tithes and offerings, but we also want to send a prayer your way. Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone 
who's partnered in this way in the manner of giving. Some are giving their tithes, some are giving their offerings. Uh, some these resources could be used for other things, but they want to honor you uh, in this way. As they give their tithes today, as they give their offerings, as they give their sacrificial gifts, may you receive them and may you respond by blessing them all the more. May you respond by releasing even greater blessings so that they can be more uh, 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 grateful and respond to you in even greater ways. In just name we do pray and believe and all of us said, Amen. Our first Spelling Bee contestant is Diamond. Your word is intelligence. Can you use it in a sentence, please? I wish I was judging this contest with someone with a bit more intelligence. I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-E-N-C-E, -L -L -E -E. intelligence. That's correct. <laughs> Zoe, your word is chivalry. Can you use it in a sentence, please? In our generation, chivalry is dead. Chivalry. C H I V A L R Y. Chivalry. That's correct. <laughs> Wonderful. Ethan, your word is grace. Can you use it in a sentence, please? Grace. Uh, you know when you do like bad things, but God still loves us? Grace. How is that possible? I can pray every day for God's love to be seen in people. But if, even if we don't, God's grace is still sufficient. Grace. People can say what they want and do what they want because of God's grace. Grace. I can slap someone and I'll still ask for forgiveness because God is a gracious God. Grace. <laughs> I can give offering and not attend church, but God will still answer me because of his grace. Grace. If I don't like a certain preacher, I can church hope because God's grace is everywhere. Grace. Hello, excuse me. Grace. grace. Spell grace. Grace. G-R-A-C-E. Grace. I think you're both wrong. Oh, really, smarty pants. Why don't you define it? Sir, I think grace is what you get but not deserve. <laughs> Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo, what's up fam? Welcome to the third Sunday of April. Uh, and in, uh, as we go through this series that we've dubbed, this changes everything. Last week we took an Easter break, had an Easter special. I hope you enjoyed that together with your family and friends. Uh, and as we say through this month, we are diving deep into the story of grace. Grace, the unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor from God. As we said last week, we know that many Christians speak about God's grace, uh, but I, I believe, you know, at least for myself and for many people, that you don't quite understand what grace means, or at least how it applies deeply uh, in the Christian faith. And so this series is focused on trying to help us to understand grace. And it's my prayer that uh, as we go through that, through it, that we'll finally understand it and it will completely change our faith in God. Now, when this uh, a message of grace is preached, there are usually two ways that people respond. When you hear the story of grace, people respond in either of two ways. Number one, that those two uh, take on the grace of God, they accept it, but then they add to it a list. Yes, you accept salvation, but then on your daily walk, you easily fall into what we call the trap of legalism. You add onto it a list so that you can start earning God's favor. We will look into that today. But then next week, we'll look at the second way in which people respond. And these are the people who hear what God has done, that Jesus has forgiven your sins, your past, present, future sins, every sin that you'll ever do, the sins you did yesterday, the sins you did today in the morning, the sins that you're thinking of doing later on. Jesus has forgiven every sin. And so sometimes you take that and say, wow, 
pastor, you mean I can do anything I want? You mean I don't need to live a holy life before God? Well, 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 not too fast. We're going to be looking at the trap of licentiousness or the trap of lawlessness or the trap of license to do anything. <laughs> we'll be looking at that trap next Sunday. So stay tuned and don't you go away. For today, I want to look at the trap of legalism. And we'll define legalism as, as anything that we do or don't do in order to impress God and to win favors from him. As we said last week, when Jesus died on the cross for you and I, when he cried, it is finished, he meant it. That never again would a man or woman who received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, would they face the judgment of God. Why? Because Jesus took their place on the cross. Just like he did for Barabbas when he died for his sins. That same price was paid for you. He purchased, God's, uh, uh, he purchased your freedom uh, from God's judgment and God's wrath. When Jesus paid, uh, died on the cross, he just didn't pay for your past sins. He paid for your present sins. He paid for your future sins as well. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 says this. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and the blood of calves, he entered the most holy place once for all and secured your, your redemption forever. Once for all time, like for all time. Past, present, future, for all time, he secured your redemption forever. Jesus is not going to die again tomorrow for the sins you'll do tomorrow. His grace has saved you. His grace is saving you. His grace will usher you into his glory. Now, my friends, I need you to get this. I need you to get this. Not only did Jesus forgive you, not only did the death of Jesus on the cross forgive you, not only did that death change everything, but... He also warned you every blessing and every answer to prayer that God has apportioned for you. Come on, somebody. That there is nothing more that you can do to attract God's blessing for you today. God's favor for you has already been paid in full by Jesus Christ on that cross. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. That every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been abundantly poured out upon us as a love gift from a wonderful father, the father of our Lord Jesus, because when God looks at us, he sees us wrapped in Christ. My friends, this is called amazing grace that we'll never have to try to win God's favor. Christ paid it all for us. We, have, we, we will never have to uh, uh, do anything to attract God's blessings. Christ has already done that for us. God is not keeping a scorecard uh, uh, for you. In fact, there is no uh, scorecard. Grace to you is abundant. You cannot win more for yourself. You cannot do anything to impress God. So yes, death of Christ on the cross. Number one, forgive you all your sins. But number two, warn you every blessing and every favor and everything that you need from God. Most of us know that to be true. Most of us know. At least the first part to be true, that we have been saved by grace, that our slate has been wiped clean. We know that. The problem for many of us is after salvation, we now begin to think, well, since my past sins have been forgiven, I now need to work hard not to commit another sin. I now need to work hard to impress God by the way I live moving forward. I was saved by grace, but now I must impress God by my, 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 by my performance going forward. Yes, God had mercy on me when I was helpless, but now that I am saved, now that I belong to him, I must work hard to impress God so that he, uh, every time he looks at me, he can say, well, isn't it an amazing thing that I saved Kevin Kilonzi? Look at how well he's living. We feel like we need to give God props for what he did for us. And a lot of us go ahead and we come up with lists. Or people impose lists on us and we feel that we must live by those list, lists. Oftentimes, the way it comes out in mature Christians is that we feel that we must live a certain way in order to attract God's blessing to us. We feel that we cannot miss morning prayers. Hey, with your videos on and mics unmuted. Hey, we feel that we must be on time with our Bible readings. I cannot miss one day. If I miss my morning devotion, if I don't have my, my uh, you know, reading ticked, talked about it tick. Hey, we feel that we'll not get God's favor. If I don't go to church, maybe my business won't thrive. If I don't tithe, maybe I won't grow wealthy. You see, grace sometimes is not easy to understand because we have no equivalent reference point in life. When we, we have been taught uh, uh, since the day we were born, we have been 
taught to perform. It has been drummed on us. It has been drummed on us from the day we were born that success comes from performance. You perform to get your promotion. You perform to advance in your career. You perform to get an opportunity in the schooling system. You perform uh, 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 to get love in marriage. Hallelujah, man. You perform. <laughs> so that you can get love for your family. You perform so that your parents can be happy with you. And so when we get born again, we transfer that philosophy of performance to God and we start trying to perform to catch his attention, to catch his favor, to catch his blessing so that our prayers can be answered, so that you can be healthy. And the pressure is even more because as a Christian, when you compare your religion with any other religion in the world apart from Bible-believing Christianity, all of them work on a merit system. And some of the major, you know, denominations in the Christian faith also work on a merit system where, you know, you, you add on to what Jesus did on the cross so that you can go to heaven. In fact, stop anyone on the street and ask them, what is your opinion on what makes someone get to heaven? And you'll hear someone say, you need to be a good person. You need to be on a certain merit system. And it's a lie. And many will tell you that God helps those who help themselves. Not true. Hey, come on. And so we've come to believe that favor and blessing from God will come when I perform. And we think that if I don't do this thing, man, if I don't do my morning prayer, if I don't attend first service, first row, and, and come on, shout, come on, man, when the preacher is preaching, then God will not do the thing that he said he'll do for me. <laughs> and our philosophy seems to be that I was saved by grace, come on, but now I must live by works my devotion to God, my tithe on time, my serving in church, my, my prayer time in check. Now, all these things are important for us to do as Christians, and we must do them. But if you are doing them to attract and to please God and to perform for him so that you can attract his blessings and favor, then you corrupt them and they become worthless. So I'm trying to bust your bubble here today, friends, and say this. Come on, somebody, listen. Jesus did not pay a deposit for your sins. Jesus paid the full price. Oh, come on, somebody. When he cried on the cross and said, it's finished, he meant it. That's the gospel. That's the good news. This changes everything. Trying to perform for God, to impress him and to win favor from him uh, is nothing but a slap in the face of God. It's like trying to say, God, back then I was a sinner. I needed grace. Thank you. Now that I have matured, I'm all grown up. Let me help you out. Let me add works so that you can earn your blessings. And if you're a Christian trying to live in trying to impress God so that you can attract his favor, it shows that you've truly not understood God's grace. His undeserved, and unmerited, unearned favor. It is grace that has saved you. It is his grace that maintains you and gives you every spiritual blessing that is in Christ Jesus. And it is his grace that will usher you into glory. You see, at salvation, in fact, I made a mistake. At salvation, is not just that your slate was wiped clean. At salvation, the slate was pulverized. It was crushed into dust. There is no longer a slate. God is not keeping a scorecard. Christ paid it all. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. And neither does God because his love personified. Come on, somebody. Oh, yes. Going back to rules is a sign that for you, Christ's death was not enough. That God's grace was not enough. And you want at least to earn your salvation so that you can impress God. Work so that you can show God that you're worthy of his blessings and your favor. No, it's unmerited, it's unearned. And sometimes, sometimes, as Christians, we indicate signs of rules in our lives by how we come to God in prayer. And we feel, you know, sometimes we say, God, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed, yet you did not give me the promotion. And so we feel that we've earned the promotion because of the list we kept. You know, Lord, I've done my part. I've kept the list. I've been a good boy. I've been a good girl. Give me my promotion. Or we say, Lord, three years I've prayed for a husband. I've been faithful to attend church. I have attended every worship night. I have served in the Sunday school. I lead a discipleship group. I attend morning prayers with my mic on and video on. <laughs> mic unmuted and video on. But I still don't have a husband, Lord. Lord, I've, prayed, I've played my part. But you're not delivering the goods. Lord, my, fall, my marriage is falling apart even though I've been a good Christian. Lord, I've tried and tried to stay away from alcohol, but I keep falling back into the addiction. And so maybe I'm not a good Christian. I feel like a failure. And so I don't want to pretend anymore. I'm giving up on my faith. And so when these things happen, we, we get tired of the list, man, because you are never meant to live your Christian faith based on the list. 
and we give up our, on our faith and we don't go to church anymore because God somehow doesn't seem to be playing by the rules. Like, let me give you a story, guys. Back in 2020, December 2020, my wife and I were on a roll as far as our Christian faith is concerned. Let me tell you guys, Ash, we had just moved from Mavuno Lifeway to Mavuno Downtown, a much bigger campus and what? Now starting to lead that. And my wife and I got into a deep season of prayer and fasting. Praise the Lord. Hey, let me tell you guys, genuinely, we were praying, we were fasting, we were giving. Because it was just a season that we felt just get into there. And we, we did that. When we finished, I think we finished our prayer and fasting like on a Wednesday or something like that. And then we were traveling to uh, our, you know, my uh, faith's parents' place, which is up country, five hours away from Nairobi. And as we went there, we got into an accident, a, a nasty accident, I must say. And I, I remember wondering, God, I've done everything. I've prayed, I've fasted. It wasn't even a season of praying and fasted. We are giving our first fruits because we are not giving our first fruits as we are looking into the next, into the next year. Like, God, God, you've done everything. Yeah? Uh, and I remember, I remember at that point we fell into debt, like a deep, dark dungeon debt. And I remember God wondering, God, you know, I've done everything. But do you know, guys, God's blessing or quote-unquote lack of blessing to us had nothing to do with our performance. The only favor I have from God is because of what Christ did for me at the cross of Calvary. It is not got by anything I do, will ever do, or not do. Everything else that I do is, you know, God's either leading me, God's teaching us uh, so that we can depend on him more fully, whatever. But it's not so that we can earn God's blessing or not earn God's blessing. My relationship with God does not operate on the currency of merit cards. It operates on the currency of grace. You can't earn grace. You can't earn God's favor. You can't earn his blessings because Christ has already won all of that for you. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, that praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Imagine with me. Your parents have educated you. You've gone to school. You've done well. At the height of your career, you finally realize, guys, I've made it in life. You know, those days when you just want to walk in town and find some of your high school buddies and so that they can look at you and realize you've made it in life, yeah? Or when you're driving, you don't mind the jam. In fact, you, you, you roll out down the window so that your friends can perhaps see that you've made it in life. Now, imagine at that height of make it in life. You call your parents for a hangout in your place and you call their friends. And then you say, Dad, Mom, I've calculated everything that you used to school me. I've calculated how much it took for you to go to the hospital, how much it took for you to, you know, change my diapers, all the vaccines, the schools, the school books, the uniform, everything. I've calculated it. And so here's a check because I want to pay you back for everything you did for me. Your parents will be horrified. They didn't do it for you to pay back, you know, to them. They gladly did it for you. And in the same way, you can't earn God's grace. You can't buy God's grace with good work, you know, good works. You can't, and you can't also forfeit it with bad deeds, you know. Our so-called demerits do not compel God to withdraw his grace from us. And our good deeds do not compel him to give us anything extra. He's already released all of that for you. And so, I don't know where you are as you, as you listen to this uh, message today. You know, I need you to understand that it's God's nature to be gracious towards you and to cover you with his grace. Whether you've sinned or not sinned, God wants to be gracious with you. In fact, there's a book, Isaiah says that the Lord longs to be gracious with you. And so stop condemning yourself for your failures and shortcomings. Instead, be kind with yourself because God is kind with you. Living by grace means that you're free from performance. God is giving you an A where you deserved an F. You are loved and accepted by God through the merit of Jesus Christ. And that merit system of Christ Jesus will never be exhausted. This understanding of grace and living this truth is countercultural. And sometimes we, we are afraid of confessing it because we think, man, if, if I confess that Jesus has already done everything, then maybe I'll be comfortable. And so sometimes we come up with rules so that we can work out something of our salvation. Because we feel, if, if Jesus has already done it, then why do I need to do? No. And sometimes you're afraid of doing that and want Christian duties so that you can earn favor 
from God. But here is what I'm saying. Yes, let's do these things. But we do good works because God ordained us to do good works. We don't do them so that you can earn favor from God. We do it as a response, come on people, as a response to the grace that God has already given us. We don't do it to initiate. We, don't, we do it to respond. I don't do, I don't need to perform to God. My obedience is not filled by a desire to perform. It is filled by a desire to be grateful for what Jesus did for us. And so our concerns and intentions are good, but sometimes they can lead us to the trap of legalism. Listen to what Paul tells the Galatians in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. <laughs> I love the message version. <laughs> oh, you dear idiots of Galatia, who saw Christ Jesus crucified so plainly, who has, who has cast a spell on you. I will ask you one simple question. Did you receive the spirit of God by trying to keep the law or by believing the message of the gospel? Surely, you can't be so idiotic as to think that a man begins his spiritual life in the spirit and then completes it by reverting to outward observances. Has all your painful experience brought you nowhere? I simply cannot believe it of you. Does God give you his spirit and works miracle among you? Do these things because you have obeyed the law or because you have believed in the gospel. Ask yourselves that. Mavuno Church, ask yourselves that. Has God blessed you because you've kept the law or has God blessed you because of the gospel, because of his grace? So let me quickly finish by sharing with you three problems that I see that come up when Christians get into this trap of legalism. When you start living legalistically, this is, these are the three problems that you've encountered. Number one, but let me give it as an example. If <laughs> we drive in Kenya, so let's say you're one of those perfect Kenyans of which you know, we, we don't like you, but yeah, I assume you're one of them. And you keep all the traffic rules, that's why we don't like you. You keep all of them, man. You exercise learning discipline, you signal when you're turning, you, you put hazards when you're near uh, 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 bumps, uh, you know, you wait for the light to turn green, and you, know, you do all those things. Does the government ever reward you for that? No! If, so if, <laughs> number, in fact, the day that a cop catches you breaking just one law, they treat you as though you've broken the entire law. It's the same thing with God. If you're going to play by the rules, there's nothing you expect from God because you're playing by the rules anyway. And the day you break one of the law, you've broken the entire law. And so, and so, and so, you're not, stop expecting favor from God because you've kept the, the, the law. You know, ex, you know, expect favor from God because He's gracious. And don't go to God and say, God, I did it except for do this. No. God, do this because your son died on the cross for me. Oh, come on, somebody. <laughs> Number two, the problem you experience when you start earn, trying to earn God's favor because of your works is because Isaiah 64, verse 5 and 7 actually shows us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. <laughs> filthy rags. In fact, let me put it this way. Let me start with the ladies. <laughs> Isaiah 64, verse 5. How can we be saved? Ladies, I, I want to put fill the rugs in a language that you can understand. We are all like one who is unclean. All our so-called righteous acts are like a dirty, dirty rather, used up tampon rug in the Lord's sight. Now, because men, at least for most part, don't know how tampons work. Let me share with you that same verse in a way that men you can understand. How can then we be saved? Men, we are all like one who is unclean. All our so-called righteous acts in God's sight are like dirty, used up toilet paper that we have just wiped ourselves with and when we present to God as a sign of our good works. Oh, come on. When the Bible says it's as filthy rags, like the righteous act, my morning prayer, my prayer living, my word, all of it is as filthy rags. Nothing that you can present to God that God will make say, wow, that, that's pretty impressive. No, toilet paper, literally. So number one, don't expect good things from God because you've done righteous acts. You break one, you've broken all. 
Number two, your righteous act by themselves are like filthy rugs. But then number three, number three, you see, when you keep the law, when you keep the rules and you break one of the rules, there is a heaviness that comes with that. And so you wake up in the morning, you're like, I didn't wake up for morning prayer. Oh man, I'm 15 days late in reading my Bible. Oh man, and, you, and all of a sudden the thing becomes weighty and weighty and weighty. And the more you break, the deeper you go and the deeper you feel guilt. And one day you wake up and say, God, I cannot keep your law. I cannot do this thing. I give up on Christianity. And so there are many people today who have left their faith because their weight becomes more. You, you woke up and said, I'll never drink again. Then you drank. You're like, okay, I'll never drink again. Then you drink because you said you'll never drink again. And then now you, you wake up one day and you are so deep in it. Hey, come with your drunkenness. It is not because of your drunkenness that Christ saved you. It is in spite of your drunkenness. And in fact, it is in his presence that that thing gets worked out of you. Come on, somebody. Come with the issue. Let the Lord be able to work it out of you. So should we do good works? Yes. Ephesians 2 10 says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The difference, however, listen, the difference, however, is that you're not doing the good works to earn God's favor. You do them as a response to what is already done for you. You serve in church because, you know, you love God and you want to respond to him. You read your Bible because you want to know him, not because you want marks. We do not do them so that you can perform so that God can, we can be in God God's books. No, we do them as a sign of gratitude for what is already done for us. This is what amazing grace does for us. So if our good deeds are done to get something from God, then they are dirty menstrual rugs. But if our good, good, books, good deeds rather are done as a gratitude to God for his saving grace, then the Lord says there are prison aroma going up to the Father's nostrils. And so I want us to pray as I conclude uh, uh, today's conversation, I want us to read from Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Uh, Jude is just one chapter, but verse 24 says, To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Ah, guys, there's someone who's able to keep you from falling, to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Grace is such that he saves you. He gives you everything that you need. You don't need to perform for it. And more than that, he ushers you into his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Why? Jesus changed everything. The blood has been shed. He didn't just pay a deposit for your sin. He paid the full price. And so Heavenly Father, thank you for someone who's watching today. And some of them have been knee deep in legalism, neck deep in legalism. And it was out of a good part of our lives, oh God. We wanted to please you, wanted to do the good things. But we didn't do them as a response to your love. We did it to earn your love. And this is legalism, oh God. And for some of us, it's not just that we did it, it's that we expected others to do it. And when they did do it, oh God, maybe we crushed or we felt crushed. And so Lord, I want to pray and ask you, to have mercy on us, to have grace on us, that all of us may know that you're not doing these things to earn your favor. We are doing these things because we are already favored. In Jesus' name we do pray and believe. And all of us said, amen and amen. Thank you all. See you next Sunday.